So one of the big complaints that I always hear from Google, as people have started using Google Analytics 4, so show of hands, how many people haven't yet migrated to GA4? Okay, you're aware that your universal analytics has stopped working. So I'm not talking about how to switch over because it's fairly self-explanatory in their setup guides, but you better start doing it uh, because things get measured differently. And what do I mean by that? I heard the same complaints. Right now I'm hearing people look at GA4, they're looking at the universe. I have more sessions, I have less sessions, I have more users, less users. My channels are all different. What's going on? When G Universal Analytics came out and replaced what was called Google Analytics, so Universal Analytics is really GA3, I heard the same complaints. Numbers dropped, numbers went up. People were screaming, I can't find this in the user interface. Nothing has changed. And I even used the precursor to Google Analytics, Google Analytics 1, which was called Urchant, that they bought out. So give you an idea that things have changed many times. I'm out of Canada. We are supposed to measure everything in metric. And if I were telling you that my office is three meters wide, you might go, what is he saying? Is it a big office? Is it a small office? You get out your tape measure and realize that's about 10 feet. That's the same thing when you're doing these measurements. So don't stress out over about the numbers. I have a whole slide deck for conferences I've given many times about putting numbers in context. Numbers are numbers. Out of context, they're just numbers. So this is the way. The trends stay the same. So try to explain the differences between Universal Analytics and GA4. One, Universal Analytics officially was called user-based. GA4 is event-based. So anybody who set up their GA4 and is looking at it, there's an events report. And there was one buried in Universal Analytics, but not everything was an event. So what do I mean by user base? So I just realized the colors I chose aren't great. When a user visited your site on Universal Analytics, they got a cookie. We're all familiar with those lovely cookies that everyone's paranoid about. If they don't accept the cookie, nothing got built. No traffic was recorded. But then on top of that cookie, Google says, oh, here's a date and timestamp. Oh, what did they do? We have a page view. We have some URLs. We have browser information. Great, we recorded it. Next, oh, they went to another page. Let's put another block on top. So everything was built upon it. When you start talking about event-based, think of it as a big bowl of plastic beads for your kids to play with. Each bead is a self-contained nugget of information. It has the user information, it has the timestamp, what the event was, all sorts of information. What's the big advantage of having beads as opposed to building blocks? You can put strings through those beads. Those are your reports. If I want to grab every event that a certain user went, maybe that user is green beads. I can do a string of green beads. If I want to you know, do a report of a, another event. How many people you need me? A little bit different today. If you're like a step this way or even on this side. Better on this side? Fine. I'll do it this way. Perfect. Better. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, but you can now pick up the beads of a certain event. How many people? What, what happened with the video? Clicked, played video. That is a string. And those beads can be on multiple strings. So you can have very complex reporting. So that is the power of it, and part of what people are finding very confusing. Now, talking about some of the differences, and these are the complaints I've heard for the, about the past two years as people were migrating, including me. Some I was happy with, some I weren't. People got upset. Now, I'm going to cover these are the points I'm covering in the rest next 30 minutes or so. <clears throat> There's no more bounce rate. OK. There's an option to automatically track special events. All right, we'll go what those are. You can have different ways of tracking users beyond the cookie. And technically, Universal Analytics had two ways, and I'll go into those, but most people never use the second way. And then there's an option to track and do some actually custom event tracking. There's more channels. How many people noticed all those new channels and got so confused? So we'll go over that a little bit. And then the famous cry, I can't find that report. Why did they rename this section? 
Yeah, well, that was the same thing when Universal started. Good news is, and I'll show you how, that's 100% now customizable, and you can make it whatever you want it to be. So let's first start with the bounce rate. Bye-bye, and to me, it's about time. Why am I saying that? How, how many people in here actually know what a bounce rate is? Give me in one of the definitions. What do you, Eric? Oh, uh, when you get to a website and then you leave right away? Nope. That's excellent. Nope. Bounce Most is when you only visit one page and then that's the page you leave. With. Right. Because Google only knew the start time. Remember that user, that building block? The next building block is the next page view or the next thing was tracked. I'll give you this example. I had a client who was in the pharmaceutical industry, but was writing articles about various diseases and treatments. It was sponsored by the pharmaceutical industry, so you get to treatments, and they'd say, this you know, family of drugs such as, and there would be one of the branded you know, pharmaceutical products. Those articles were minimum of about 1,200 words. Some were 3,000 words. I worked with them, and Joe mentioned I did a lot of SEO. We were getting them really traffic coming in on these things because they were targeted, you know, it was like medical industry writing, but for the average person. And their bounce rate was over 90%. Their sponsors were not happy. And I said to them, the problem is, I'm doing this search for whatever disease, I'm getting your article or treatments for, and I read this thing, I might not even make it to the end, and then I leave, it's a single page view. What we did, through Google Tag Manager, we added code that put a timer on, so we could try a little event every 10 seconds, so we actually started getting better timing, and how far scroll they scroll down, 25%, 50%. All of a sudden, it wasn't a bounce rate, because it wasn't a single page visit, it was an engage visit, and all of a sudden, the bounce rate on some of those pages were going down to single digits, or in the low teens. And then they were getting cues that the bounce rate was too low. So, so you gotta understand, people didn't know, but it was an easy number that looked impressive. Well, we improved the bounce rate. Okay, but how did you improve the bounce rate, right? You know, you could put a little blinking thing, click, you know, on the jumping monkey, you, you get a better, drop your bounce rate. So it's about time. Give you an idea, I've been arguing against getting rid of it since 2017, had an article, there it is, you, it's still out there. And I always like to think that Google read my article and said, okay, let's get rid of it. <laughs> I get no credit for it, and even in that I talk about putting in uh, custom events so that you can actually start tracking proper engagement. So forget the bounce rate, there's the engagement rate. Google, because it heard all the complaints, there's a hidden metric, if you really know how to get to it, called bounce rate. What they did is they took 100% minus what they call the engagement rate, and that's your bounce rate. So it's a not engaged rate. <laughs> I still like engage rate rate. So understanding what an engagement rate is, and this is set by Google, and right now, you really can't play with it. I'm wondering if, because I'm seeing some stuff coming down the line, maybe we'll let us tweak it a little bit for our own personal needs. But there's a built-in timer now. So if a user comes to a page and stays on a page for at least 10 seconds, they're engaged. At least they had a time to come and decide, is this really what I want? Or they started scrolling. And then you'll see I put great. It assumes if you actually enabled these things, we'll talk about in a second. Or they clicked on something. So they might have played video before you had to have special code in there to be able to report on video plays. So all of a sudden, great, you can have that single page visit, but they spend more than 10 seconds, they scroll down the piece, they're engaged. So you start getting it. So now you can go back and say, ah, now I understand what the engagement rate is and why it's more important than whatever our bounce rate ever meant to me. So there's the option I mentioned to track special events. That's the scroll, time on page. If you follow the install instructions correctly, they turn on automatically. If you don't follow them correctly, they're there, but they may be disabled. When you go in through the admin interface, there's something called the data stream. And so I'll assume there's a laser on here. Hmm? You gotta find the button to push. Oh, there, there we go. Whoa, nope, that's uh, not, not where. <laughs> that was the wrong button. <laughs> that was the fast forward. Uh, so anyway, uh, anyway, I'll just I'll do it the old-fashioned way. 
that you get them down here at the bottom. And you, these are the ones that are enabled. These are enabled for Google's tracking, not necessarily for reporting. And that is one of the subtleties in the Google's lack of documentation. But yeah, I turn them on. Why can't I report on them? Why can't I see how long people are spending on this page in increments? So to do that, you need to go down to Modify Events. And you actually have to click in there and say, add this event to my reporting. So it'll be a, a, a metric that I can report on. So it's a little more complicated. I'm not doing screenshots by screenshots of this. But Google, if they're turned on, will affect those first row will affect your engagement rate. If you want to be able to report on them, you got to come down below. But within the data streaming place that where I was at, you can modify events. You can do some custom event tracking. So you might have a certain page that if someone gets that page, it's not necessarily a conversion. It's not the thank you for your purchase, but it might be a, cert, a very valuable page that you want. And you don't just want to have to always be searching for that URL in the page list. So you can create an event where page view equals this and have an event name. And a lot can be done just now through the new GA4 admin interface. So layman, more or less, can do it. There's Google Tag Manager, which still gives us greater flexibility and easier testing things, but you don't have to add Tag Manager. And I know there are many companies which they fought even to get the Google Tags put on. So there's ways of doing it without Tag Manager. For example, with the scroll tracking, Google, if you enable scroll tracking and you add scroll tracking to the report modules, Google will only tell you when someone reached 90%. To me, that's pretty useless. I want to know 25%, 50% of the page. So that you still need to go and put the custom code in through Google Tag Manager and disable it in this interface. So you can't have both running in competition. So there's a few little subtleties in there. So still, if you're familiar with Google Tag Manager, that's a whole other talk. Uh, but you may want to look into it. It's still more powerful, and it helps you even elevate GA4 further. In Universal Analytics, this was my favorite one with one of my clients, your data was subject to sampling. Anybody ever run into the sampling issue? Yeah, I know, Joe. Yeah, a few of us. Most people don't even realize when they were getting it. So officially, and they cha kept changing this number over the years, unless you had, if you had Google 360, which was a paid version of Google, they bumped up the number. But if you took a reporting period and you had over 500,000 sessions, Google sampled your data. So what did that mean? So in this case, we'll say there, I'm taking a year's worth of data and I have a million sessions. Google goes and takes one in of every other event, then extracts it, and then multiplies it by two to give you your data. Your data was so wrong. This impacted one of my clients enormously where we were doing quarterly reports. So we'd pull up a quarter and we were just on the cusp. Then they hired some new people and they said, no, I want to see a six month report. And their data was showing less than they had in three months because the sampling was messing up for all these versions, all these sales. And they had to explain it to them. You can't do this. You want to get, even if the Google 360, they would have gone over their limit. So there was data sampling. So that's gone in GA4. So that's the good news. However, Google has a new term called thresholding. I call it throttling your data. So if you hear me use the term throttling, <laughs> I use it interchangeably, but it's officially thresholding. So what does thresholding mean? It means you at the top of your reports, your numbers are going to look really weird. You're going to get this red triangle. And it gives you a bunch of BS that is not pulling in 100% of your data. The re and you can go into pages and pages of why they're doing this. They're basically saying, well, it all has to do with privacy, that the way that you've narrowed down your data so much, you might be able to identify a specific individual, yada, yada. I, don't, I think they're just trying to do this to get us frustrated, all right? <laughs> but there is a workaround. So has anybody been getting thresholding data errors? Because I get it with a few of my clients. No? Oh, that's good. Then you're lucky. Or you haven't noticed it, because your data is going to look really wonky. <laughs> so it's usually, for example, if you go to a channels report, and then you say, Show me my source medium next to it. So you maybe even just said, show me my page search and show me my source medium. 
or show me my campaigns next to it, you may get your throttling. So as you get drilled down, you may get it. So be aware of it. And I put some slides in here which explains it. There's something called Google Signals. And I'm going to start alluding to these things. You met, I mentioned before that officially in Universal Analytics, there were two ways of measuring users. Primarily, everybody used cookies. If you had an e-commerce site or a secure site where users were logged in, you could use their user ID to track them. But most people didn't know how to do it, and very few sites ever did it. Well, now, uh, GA4 has come up with Google Signals. And they finally reveal what Google Signals was, but when they first, about two years ago when they revealed it, they didn't tell people, and I guessed, and a lot of us guessed what it was. How many people here have Gmail accounts? How many people, when they signed up for it, realized there was a tick box that you're allowing Google to track you and send customized ads to you? If you said yes to that, you're now part of the Google Signal database. So if you don't accept the cookie on visiting your, somebody's website and you're logged in with a Gmail account where you said that you could personalize ads for me, they will track you that way. So that's part of the privacy questions that are going on now with all this. And that's why they're thresholding data because you might be able to narrow down who that particular person was. So that's one of the things about Google Signals. So here are the options, and you're going to be loving this one because I love how Google hides things that are important with these show more. Well, we go. So Google claims now with GA4 out of their default, how do I identify individual users? These are the factors. The standard cookie, if the user accepts it. Because of GDRP and people's privacy concerns, a lot of people are rejecting cookies. Okay. Ah. We have Google Signals. If you gave us permission, we have permission. They're using some machine learning. They're using what they claim is artificial intelligence. And they, what I call their secret sauce. They don't really want to reveal it. And you'll understand why I say that. So here, so if you go into your admin screen, and this is a critical area, in your area there's something called reporting identity. Google shows you two options. The default option is blended, and it tells you what they are. Evaluates, first of all, a user ID if it's present, Google signals, device ID, which is the cookie, and model data. And for most people, when they first set this up, you'll see two inactive ones, because first of all, you have to set them up and give them permission. Oh, there has another one, which is observed. User ID, Google signals, device ID, just turned off model data. So one inactive, okay. But more importantly, there's show all. So when you show all, there's device-based only. This is how universal analytics worked. You can switch to measuring just the way you did in universal analytics, for good or for bad. When you, how many people like, really, you know, when most people say, my numbers are so different, they make this switch and their numbers come much closer in line because now, those Google signals where Google was trying to guess who that person was is taken out of the equation. And if you were having a lot of people who were not accepting cookies, you'll be showing lower numbers. And under GA4, you show higher numbers. So that is understanding that. But I want to show one thing. So here's the issue with Google signals. It sounds better than it is, right? Because technically, it's about ad personalization. So there are people out there who haven't accepted that. I don't know how many people actually read those things, but I'm sure there's some. So just be aware, it's not a perfect solution. And because of that, uh, thresholding is an issue. All right. And technically, you should be adding something to your privacy policy. Even though Google has permission, you're supposed to add a one-liner. And I've asked Google for, do they have a standard line I could put in a privacy policy? They go, no, no, talk to your lawyers. So. <laughs> I just say, I, I, from what I've talked to a few lawyers, they say the fact that you say we use various tracking mechanisms for analytics purposes only, you're probably sufficient. But, you know, always check with your lawyers. So under your default settings, you have to go in. You have blended this and so forth. And data modeling. Here's the one thing about data modeling. I have, I don't know, probably 
I'm not talking small companies that help, you know, like, you know, a blogger who, you know, has their blogging site. I'm talking, you know, companies that do millions of dollars in monthly sales. Data modeling hasn't been turned on yet for them. I've given permission. I've not seen it. So that's why I say it's that magic sauce, that ma ma magic potion. Google is telling people that it's not ready yet. So at some point it will kick in, but we don't know what it is. And that's their machine learning and artificial intelligence. But to give you an idea, for right now, because that model data doesn't work for anybody, I pulled compare blended versus observed, and I get the same numbers. I did device based, I get slightly different low, I get slightly lower numbers for this particular client. The great news about that reporting identity, you can change it anytime you want, and it will reprocess your data. It appears to be instant, but when you go back, if, you, if I were to do it now and I right away I go say, show me what happened two months ago, it may not be there. It could take up to 24 hours. I've seen up to 48 hours, depending on how much data that has to reprocess. So you can switch back and forth and find the numbers you like. So that's the good news. <laughs> My numbers are too low. Okay, we'll go to this one. It bumps them up. <laughs> So, but please, you know, be consistent for reporting purposes. So just be aware that things like this are powers. Where there were changes that I could do in universal analytics, I could put in track by user ID. Because I had a client where they, it was a B2B site. They couldn't care less who came to their site because you couldn't even register. It was really only for their customers. We tracked everybody by user. But I couldn't go historically back and put it in. We actually ended up running in parallel to just show what the data was. So it gives you some understanding. Which option is best for you? Everybody is different. But if you're a non-e-commerce site, and it doesn't require a user login, so you don't have a user ID, if you don't care about cross-device tracking, because once I mentioned a few minutes ago, because of that Google signal, Google knows if I came to your website first on my cell phone, then on my desktop, and then back to my cell phone, they can, because your signal's following you. Cookies never could do that. And user IDs, they know what kind of device you are. GDRP, the European privacy laws, if that doesn't affect you, then you, because that's where you have to put out that massive thing, we have cookies, permission to use our cookies, you know? And so many people, as soon as you tell people you're using them and they give them a chance, nope, they'll hit no. Uh, then you can use device base. And I only do this if I'm seeing thresholding, by the way. So sometimes I have clients where I have to pull a report and I'm getting that thresholding where my numbers are like, instead of being 10,000, I'm getting like 200. I go here, I turn it off, and I generate that report. And then I put it back to what I was using. So just that flexibility that I can do it in real time because of those little beads I mentioned. Google just says, oh, I just have to reorganize the beads. I don't have to rebuild the wall with those building blocks. So it's coming back to that kind of perspective. And once again, the benefits of device-based tracking, you're not subject to the thresholding. There's no sampling that existed in universal analytics. Changes are retroactive, so you can flip them back and forth as often as you want. And just be aware that for all your historical data, it could take up to 24 hours but usually within like a week's worth of data is almost instantaneous. So just be aware, you, you know, as I tell people, if you do really want to do it, do it before you go home at night, and the, the data should all be processed by the next morning. And you can always revert if you don't like the data. So now we're going to talk about more options about specific events, because remember, each bead is an event. In universal analytics that everybody loved, you could only have 300 custom events. Okay, I've worked with some big clients. Nobody has 300 unique events. <laughs> but I'm sure somebody pushed the limits out there. But parameters that went to those events, I, I could have an event category, an event action, and an event label. I don't know. I work with clients. We have many more parameters, more uh, descriptors for specific events that we want to track. So not just what category it is, you know, lead generation. I could have a parameter of what the source was, what even, you know, all sorts of parameters on there. So I had only these three. In GA4, there are unlimited number of events that you can create. They do have one limitation, is that you can only report on 500 per day, the top 
500. So if you have 600 and all 600 happen that day, sorry, you don't get reports on the lower number. But if you have ones that only happen sporadically, you're fine. But once again, I don't know people who hit the 300, so I'm sure I'm not going to run into people fighting the 600, uh, the, uh, the 500 limit. And event names are, can it be up to 40 characters? I tell people keep them to 38 because Google, like we had goals in Universal Analytics, they now call them conversions. It's different terminology. If you mark something as a conversion, it adds, you don't see it, but it adds two characters to the end of the name. So you keep the 38. Also, uh, we'll go over a few other things. And event parameters, 25. So 25 descriptors for an event. That's quite a bit. That's for the event, not for your GA4 configuration. You can keep a track of them all. You can have them. So, and those are custom ones. Those are not, sorry, those are both built-in and custom ones to an event. Once again, everything is an event, so use names. When you're creating events, use names to help organize your thing. Use good words. I hate acronyms, and I see too many of, when I go and start auditing some of these sites, what's this event, and they come up with some internal, and that person who named it is gone, and nobody knows what that three-letter or four-letter acronym meant. Whoa, everybody uses it here, and they, no. So keep them in real and meaningful way. Don't use spaces. Google is being very strict and anal retentive on this. For, for, any, for parameter names, for event names, do not use spaces. Do, keep it all lowercase and use underscores between spaces. I had a client who we taught, I taught how to do this. He went and he was getting problems and he couldn't get his conversion because he had a space in his event name. He put the underscore in, all of a sudden the conversions were getting reported. So little subtleties. Yeah, I wish it was a little more flexible, but that's part of Google's organization. Now we're going to get into the reporting, the acquisition reports. So from an SEO, from my days in SEO, my paid search, from my days running PPC, my social media marketing, this was where I lived and breathed. My channels, I had my default channels, I was traffic going up, how are they doing? More defined channels. I lost count because Google keeps adding in more channels, by the way. <laughs> I think the last time, though, was about six, seven months ago. But they keep adding in more channels. Uh, and they added two categories now. In your navigation under acquisition, under the overview, you'll have user acquisition and traffic acquisition. User acquisition is first touch acquisition. What brought that user to your site the first time? It's not their first visit, it's what brought them the first time. Traffic acquisition is what brought them the most recent session. And they are two different numbers where before you just got how they came and there was no separation of the two. And numbers can be very bizarre looking when you start comparing them. And that even some of the metrics that they provide are different on user attribute. So if you want to see Conversions on what my first touch attribution is, you're going to be looking at the user acquisition. If you want to see overall what was the last way they came in, you're going to look at your traffic acquisition. So, what you know, this is what brought the user there the first time. And I am going to point something out. We'll talk about it a little bit later. In about 60 seconds, we have my favorite new channel, unassigned. <laughs> And I will explain it to you. And it drives me nuts. And I'm driving everybody nuts. Especially this from one of my clients. And it's, the numbers jumped up horrendously after uh, they switched to their version 2.0 of their, their site. But we're resolving it. Uh, so we get first touch. Great. We still, you know, when we can come in, we can look at the session. We get still the over, total sales are the same. The revenue. But it's a little, I'm going to go back. You can just see the numbers. You know, direct was... You know, 675,000. Well, direct as a session, you know, 1.1 million. Yeah, that's a big difference. Why? Because they came from paid search. They came from organic search. But now they know the site. Now they're coming direct. They bookmarked it. They know the site. They know the URL. Whatever it is that bring them direct. 
A word of caution, if you, for those who are doing the switch in the next few weeks to GA4, the day you launch GA4, you don't, you don't know how that person first found your site. It's how they found that you, the first the site the first time you have GA4 in place. It does not go and read anything from the old universal analytics. So you're always going to have that spike at the beginning of that direct. Everybody who already knows you. So be very cautious of that. I'm now seeing you know, clients have been running it for over a year, and I've seen a nice steady decline as first touch attribution being direct. And Eric, we were talking about... Uh, all the subliminal stuff earlier that like, drives people to a site and brand awareness. That's, you know, that could be the direct ones as well. So keep that in mind. Here are some of the new, more popular channels that I'm running into. Uh, paid and organic social. I used to spend a lot of time creating custom channels in the universal analytics. So we could separate out paid social. Because if you put CPC as your medium, it came in as paid search and drove everybody who's doing Facebook ads nuts because it wasn't search. Uh, so they figured it out. Uh, they've added uh, paid versus organic shopping sites. You have paid versus organic video. There's a whole bunch more there. I gave a link in this. You can go there. You'll see the whole list and what your UTM codes need to be to match and get categorized accordingly. Google is using its artificial intelligence to try and figure out what some of these sites that might be driving traffic to you are, where it does not seem to be a normal, you know, referral link. And that's part we'll talk in a, in a second about. The MSI channel, that's part of it. Google sees this traffic coming to your site from, I don't know, it's not really like, here's a link to that site, that's definitely a referral we... You know, there's an AREF code. I don't know how many people are HTML coders. They, oh, yeah, I know what it is. No, they might have some parameters in there. There might be a UTM parameter that doesn't match one of the defined ones. I don't know what it is. The good news is Google's trying to figure it out and is doing it retroactively. So for that client where we have that huge jump in unassigned, we were panicking. We are trying to figure it out. I went back and looked after two days, in two days historically, it had dropped down significantly. So be aware that if you're having that, it's Google's trying to figure it out, and eventually that's that machine learning. It's understanding where I have no idea where that classification is. And sometimes I've the number I've added up the channel numbers and they don't add up. But if I take out the unassigned, it added up pretty close. So that Google is, hasn't even necessarily updated their data. So that's one of the things that we're running into is Google. Analytics 4 updates your data once per day, typically between 8 a.m. and 9 a.m. in whatever time zone you set in your, when you were setting it up. We were all familiar with Universal Analytics, which was typically about 15 minutes. Sometimes it could be up to 45 minutes. So you're getting an update once a day. And so be aware of that, and that may affect the quality of your data for that given day, because Google may be still processing it. The unassigned channel, once again, it's, it's more what I said. Uh, you, could have, you may have uh, some referred traffic that you're saying from a sister site that I don't want you to refer. I'm also personally convinced, even though I cannot prove it, I'm still trying to figure out, maybe I should get into ChatGPT and have it write up a test case for it. If a user is on my site and doesn't do anything for 30 minutes and times out and then continues, there's a new session. What channel do they come from for that session? They're not direct because they're still there. All little, so I'm thinking part of that could be unassigned. And because that's why I'm seeing such variation. So on the site, so I'm seeing a large number of unassigned. It's one of the types of sites where it could be, it's like a shopping site. People are adding things to the shopping cart and are leaving it while, let's say, they contemplate something. If it's a blog site where people come, read, and leave, I rarely see. It's, they're still there, but it's a much smaller percentage. That's where I think I cannot prove. So just keep that in mind. There's all things. Uh, and there could be cross-domain measurements. And this is another one. This is with a uh, client who has five sites around the world and they wanted to treat traffic if i went to the english site 
and then came back to the North American site, it, they didn't want it showing up as a refer. So that's fine. There's co ways of setting that up. But Google has to figure out how did they first get the UK site to give me the credit on the North American GA4 report. And, it's transfer and I've seen that being transferred. So it's being very powerful in understanding that. And that I've done and tested. So I think some of it is just Google's processing ability. Now everyone's favorite, the user interface. We all love the GA4 interface. <laughs> the best part about it is trash it and make it whatever you want. So we, this is what Universal Analytics looks like. This is what GA4 looks like. Here is what that left-hand navigation looks like. All right. OK, some different terminology, whatever. But with some customization, I can actually make it look identical. In the lower left corner, below that navigation bar, is an area called library. So poorly documented. Nobody notices it. It's hidden. You know, Google doesn't want you playing with it, but they give it to you. <laughs> when you click in there and you play in there, I'm going to give you some examples. This is for a large blogging site that it's helping with. We created a whole new left-hand navigation. We have their acquisition, so we still have the traffic acquisition. Well, we have organic social because they're spending, they have a, they hired a person just to drive traffic through social media. They want to see what that is. We also change it to behavior, not events, because they like the term behavior. So they have what landing pages they're getting, overall pages, and then they say pages which are that people are getting to from organic search really are landing pages. We just shorten the title. And organic social, those are the landing pages that people are coming to. So they have separate reports. This is completely customized to them. And when you do this, this is for everybody who has access to your Google Analytics for property, not just for you. Anyone who used Universal Analytics and created their custom report and wanted to share it, they had to email it out. The person had to add it to their account. And then if you made a change, you had to go through that whole routine again. This is for everybody. So be aware that it's very powerful. And I'm worrying now when everyone says, I know GA4, and they switch to another company, they're going to go, I don't know this interface. <laughs> because it's there. So to give you an idea, you know, this is what their pages via organic search. Uh, we start, they have conversions, which are clicks uh, to affiliate, on the affiliate links. So they want to see what pages we're driving, you know, most clicks to the affiliate links, even though we can't tell what happens once someone clicks on there, they could at least get counts of those clicks and see which ones are, you know, resonating and then figure out why. So with some customization with an e-commerce, we created a section called marketing. We have our paid campaigns. We have some general stuff. We have email by campaign because they want to just, the email team wants to be able to just isolate their campaigns on their own. And they have a blog. How effective is our blog being? So we created a section just for the marketing team. Everyone else in the company gets to look at it, but they now can zero in, speed up the day. They don't have to go in and start tweaking the existing reports just for them. So here's how this gets done. I know this is getting very technical and uh, getting late. Click on the library, and you get something that looks like this. You get to create a new collection. You get to edit a collection. If you edit, you can rename them, uh, or you create a new one. This, each one of these is a collection. So there's an acquisition collection. There's an engage. So this is the life cycle collection, and then you have with underneath there. So there's your life cycle. There's your user. There's a monetization by default. But you click on it, you're given options, you have templates, or you can start from a bare bones. I'm not going to take you through absolutely everything. But you, you give it a name, and then you drag which reports you want over into that collection. There you go. And you can even you can have overview reports, which have you know, the summaries, or you can get down to detail reports. You just drag and drop. If you want to make your own custom report, because you don't like one of the columns, one of the metrics, you're not an e-commerce site. So why do I want to show that revenue? We don't have revenue from our site. Why do I, you know, there's, I've had clients. I don't care about engagement rate. And you want to hide and get take it? So you can go create your own report. Create report, you start with a blank, or you can pick up, a, you know, get a template going and tweak it out. Say, take this out, add this. 
re change the order of things in there. And once you've finished with it and you've added it to your collection, you either publish it or unpublish. When it's published, it shows up in that left-hand navigation. If you unpublish it, it's still there, but not in the navigation. So if you don't want the monetization uh, collection, because you don't sell, go and unpublish it. It'll disappear. You want to rename uh, life cycle? You know, you want to go in and rename engagement to behavior? You go in there and click edit and rename it, if that's the term you like, because that's what you're used to looking for. So just be aware. These are some of the powers we have in GA4. And one of the underreported things, everybody is complaining about this and that, but nobody's talking about some of the power. And once you start getting into this and creating it and making it custom for your organization, you're going to see some of the benefits of why Google has revamped this entire thing. Giving you from one of my clients, and I mentioned before where they have this global, you know, they have five sites around the world, all regionally targeted because local currencies and different shipping rates. So if I come from Canada and I hit the UK site, am I expecting to get my stuff shipped from the UK to the Canada site? It'll, if I click this, it'll drive me to the North American site. But I could say, maybe I'm from Canada, but I want to buy something for someone I know in the U UK. So I want to remain. So with this was a nightmare to track in the old universal analytics. Because they're putting this in there, and they want to know what the impact is. So we have custom events. We put in there, so we they get the pop-up that says choose country, select other, reunited. And yes, the numbers don't match up because there's lots of people who delete cookies and redo things. But it's they're getting an idea of percentages. This is, this just launched last week, so that's why some of the numbers are really funky. But these are things that now you can do without having to be a technical genius. You just got to work with the IT people and understand how to define your events. And I know uh, Joe and I were talking a little bit about this. For reporting, this is also where Google is trying to drive people to, is that GA4 is the engine that's driving the data collection. How you get that data. I'm not going to talk about BigQuery because that's they're giving you a free license, a limited free license of BigQuery to store your data in that you can talk. Looker Studio, formerly known as Data Studio, or you can run Data Studio reports and do the queries. They really want to start having people not use GA4 as their interface. They haven't publicly come out and said it, but you can just see from how, what the bare bones, they went that 80-20 rule, 80% 80 of your users use 20% of reports, so we're getting rid of 80% of our reports. You want it, go create it. And they're not going to be as pretty as you'd like, so go come in here and make them pretty. So I'll give you an idea. And I mentioned this way, what, about 30 some odd minutes ago when I first started this. This was a client who wanted to see comparatively how well they're doing, both in Universal Analytics and GA4. The blue bar is GA4 numbers of uh, organic search traffic. So that would be uh, sessions coming in from organic search. The red's the old Universal Analytics. Yes, the numbers are higher. Remember, I talked, we have signals on. So we can see that percentage. But the trend is the same, and that is, and I have that thing, the num this puts numbers in context. It's not the numbers. If I told you a site got 10,000 sessions yesterday and 5,000 a day, is that good? Is it bad? We don't have it in context. It's the trend. Was that 10,000 a blip? You want to spread it out. You want to look at the trends. But when I look down here, when I was doing some of the comparisons, the number of new users, yeah, GA4 was high. Remember, I mentioned that direct because it's the first time they're coming to GA4. Total users, look, they're almost the same. Uh, forget the revenues pieces, but you can just, but the sessions, you can see the big difference because how Google's calculating those sessions, those single page visits were never a session. Your bounce rate never generated a session. It was a user who bounced. Session time, zero. So now we are capturing them because we have timers on those pages. So yes, most sites show a major increase in session counts. And you need to understand that that is why, because now there are timers. And with users, we're now picking up some of those people who were not accepting cookies. Once again, go back to your, uh, you, how you're defining your user. And if you only use the device, 
then your numbers are going to be very similar again. Look, a studio is another one. Many sites have that little search box, you know, search for a product, whatever. We looked at, you know, type of report, total users, users who search, not a huge percentage, right? Less than 3% are actually using it. And the client wanted no revenues. So grand total, but if they use a search box, what percentage? And we could do some other calculations. And then even has a lower conversion rate. They, they theorize it's probably new, you people checking out the site, looking for things they're probably less likely to buy because it, over this period. But that's it. They really wanted to say. They're trying out some new things in their test. For A-B testing in their search box. So that's the power of collecting the data in GA4 and putting something powerful like Looker Studio on top of it. Things change constantly in GA4 because it's new. And Google, and I don't think anybody at Google would not admit, or will never officially admit, but it wasn't really ready for prime time. So they're constantly tweaking based on feedback and what they're observing. So, you know, for example, a month ago, they gave you now stuff in AdWords where you can actually start doing some of that attribution modeling and giving credit to first click, last click, and pieces. So they have about that. Uh, the last update that I saw was May 2nd. It had to do with building uh, funnel reports, which were broken. And I was playing with looking at that the other day and I almost got it working <laughs> because they put a fix in it. So, you know, there's the URL. It check, you know, it's worth checking once a week, every other week, just see what's new because it could be impacting your data. So I'm going to let, you know, take some questions now on GA4 or differences between UA or any of those aspects. If you want to, you know, Joe, yeah, you know, this is a link to my, uh, to find me on LinkedIn, Google me, you'll find me. You can connect with me in many different ways. So on that note, I'll start taking questions. And Joe, you got one. Yeah. Yeah, bye bye optimize. How does that affect this? All right, so there's it's a great question because many of us who are not like the official Google partners in analytics, we've seen a lot of what they're doing and we have this feeling that they're trying to drive us into a paid model because Google came out free and wiped out all the mid tier paid solutions. You know, Google already was offering a, a paid solution there, Google 360 which is what I think 130,000 minimum a year. So what Google has done, G, the base core of GA4 for now, they say they're not changing it, but we know Google does change their minds on things, is free. But you only get data updated once a day. So the first thing they're trying to encourage you to do, and they're not storing your data, certain reports, technically you're only storing data for 14 months, but they haven't started purging anybody's data. They want you to sign up for a BigQuery database and export your data to BigQuery, which is a very complicated thing for most organizations. When you sign up for BigQuery, even though it's free, they want you to put a credit card down. So you need a corporate credit card. If you don't do it, they'll warn you and warn you and then it'll deactivate. If you do the standard implementation, there are zero charges for using BigQuery. But if you want to get essentially real-time updates from Google to BigQuery. So throughout the day, they are going to have what are called micro charges. I have a client, we just did this because they're, they're promoting some stuff and they're running big ads and they want to see during the day. They want to go to a report, we created a Looker Studio report, refresh, you know, every hour. What, what are the conversions on these new landing pages? We're doing some A-B testing because things like Optimize are gone bye-bye. So we can have three pages and we can look at them. They've been running it and they're doing a few thousand pages a day. And I think in the first week and a half, it cost them about a buck. I have another client, it costs them 12 bucks a month to have that real time. And then they put the Looker Studio reports. You still don't get the real time reports in GA4. The next part, and I run into this all the time for my clients, is the Looker Studio reports when I'm hitting GA and not so much when I'm hitting uh, BigQuery even if I not, don't have the paid version of BigQuery, they have term token, but they say, 
you can only make this many queries to GA from Looker Studio every 30 minutes. But it's not 10 queries. It's how many reports am I running? How much data am I pulling? So they have a very complicated way that you have no way of knowing. So I'm building a report, I'm running tests. Oh, I don't want to look, I'm gonna change this. I'm, and all of a sudden it says, error. I gotta put aside for 30 minutes, wait. So the option is, you gotta start buying these, and they're not even clear on their pricing on them. That's what's driving me nuts. If they would tell me it's gonna be $50 and it'll meet my needs, I can live with it. But because they have this complicated way, I can't even figure out how to charge it back to my clients. So for now, I'm, I'm doing the 30 minute wait and I go back to it. So yes, it's free, but limited. So you are getting a very, pow very powerful package, but you have to wait 24 hours for your data. You can build some great reports in Looker Studio, but just don't try running those queries too often. And if they do, but there are microcharges, but you know, when we think about how many millions of users are out there using GA4, and if they make 10 or 20 bucks per those people every month, that's a sizable amount of money. So, but I can't tell you in your organization if it's gonna be $12, it's gonna be $20, it's gonna be $200. And Google doesn't even have, and I, I've asked them, but of course I have to go through really securitous channels. Can you come up with a calculator saying, how big, you know, how many sessions do I have? How often do I need this information? Can I, and give me a, you know, approximate price. No, nope. it's just like, here's your charge for the month. But I run, you know, and it'll be on my, it's my clients put down your credit card because it's being charged on their GA. So it's to the GA account, not necessarily to the user like me. But clients don't want to put down a credit card without knowing how much it's going to cost them. So that's the dilemma on that one. So yes, unlimited free is gone, but free is still there for now. Oh, we got one with, was it Peter? Yeah, well, I don't want to take anybody's time, but um, anyway, thank you very much. You've answered like over a dozen questions that I've had trying to figure it out on myself. Um, to me, it's fairly obvious that Google is busting at the seams. They're, 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 they're tracking more and more data sets so that they're trying to like, you know, parse it out so that it's economically feasible for them to do it, giving some of the burden to us to pay for it. Um, understanding that something like bounce rate sort of went away, engagement rate is more importantly, more important, I say. Uh, for me, speaking to my client who's the layman, two questions, what are the five APIs that they should focus on, irregardless, it doesn't matter if they're e-commerce or whatever, but in general, it used to be, you know, whether it was sessions or, you know, unique business, whatever. What were the ones that we should concentrate on now? And second, what, what have you found success in saying to your client as the reason why you see a dramatic difference in the numbers going from universal to GA4? Like, how do you... I mean, they're not going to understand that. Okay, I'm going to. Oh yeah. <laughs> they're going to see fifty thousand, hundred thousand. That's all, right. all they're going to focus on. But how do you? What do you right. say? So first of all, I'm going to answer question number two, the changes in numbers, because I've seen clients with action numbers go down, and that's even more of a panic. That's more. So one of them. This is why I've encouraged all my clients to get conversion over earlier, because as I mentioned in the beginning. Canada is easier. It's metric versus imperial measurements. The numbers, and my clients all know I've all, how I've always presented, the numbers for your KPIs, first of all, are meaningless out of context. They're a percentage, right? So we'll get into the KPIs in a second. So it's just a different way of measurement, but your trends are the same, and we've always focused on the trends, the benchmarks, the trends, right? So. Yes, it's just measuring things different. We used to get apples, now we're getting oranges. You're measuring in pounds, you're measuring in kilograms. It doesn't matter. I'm making up a new measurement. And many of them have understood that and I've explained that to them for a long time. Now when it comes to KPIs, one of my things I would do with all my clients where I can get them to agree, I actually create what's called a measurement plan. We walk through their organization. 
What is, so we start with their mission statement, we come down to what the departmental things, what is your objectives, and then we define the KPIs from there. And one of the key parts with KPIs, and this really does help when you do that, if you had it done properly, a KPI isn't a number. A KPI is always a ratio. So what percentage of visitors convert? You know, universal was the goal. We had to have our goal. What, that percentage doesn't change much when I switch to GA4 if I had a proper KPI. So that's the key. So if it was 1 in 10, it's still going to be about 1 in 10. Maybe it was, you know, 9.9 .9 and now it's 9.7. Statistically irrelevant. But what's the trend? Is, but now we plot it back. If you're switching on July 1st, you're going to be in for a, a shitload of trouble because you have no baselines to compare. You know, I want everyone to have at least a month. I was telling a quarter, we want to get a year in. It was like. So what you're saying is the earlier that you transfer over, the easier it's going to be to understand the data. Yeah, afterwards. after, right. But now when it comes to your top five KPIs, and I'll say it also depends what you're doing. A KPI is, I like engagement rate uh, because it's telling me is my marketing engaging? Am I, get, am I reaching the right audience? It, it, am I reaching? So that's probably my number one. Number two in an e-commerce site is what's driving revenue? <laughs> and then, you know, sales per... What about a lead gen site? A lead, I would look, that, a lead gen is a conversion. So I'd be looking at number of lead gens per session or per use or something of that nature. So once again, Google now, they don't call them goals, they call them conversions. So define your conversions and, you know, you may have 20 different conversion points, but they're not all equally weighted. So you really want to start saying, this drove this many conversions. Is that good or bad? No. What is my conversion rate? And, but if I have four different conversions and there's quality lead jets, someone filled in a contact us form or did someone fill in give me my free white paper? Which one's more important? I can't tell you. I have to talk to the client. But now what is the ratio? I don't want to treat them the same. If I'm running an ad, but that's still lead gen. But if it's a contact us, it might be an existing customer. And how do we differentiate that? So understanding that those, so splitting them down. So you really, you know, page views is long gone. It's not been meaning. You know, I remember working 20, 25 years ago for a company who, you know, they wanted to increase page views. And it was a news type of site. So all of a sudden, all the articles got, well, it was that, if you ever, the New York Times did the same thing. They got cut in half, and there was second page. <laughs> well, they were trying to sell page views because they thought they were getting more ads. So nobody, it, people weren't even clicking. They were getting fed up. They were leaving the site. They weren't engaged. New York Times did it where they were adding like six pages to read an article because they wanted the ad revenue. So it's not things. So you just got to. I have an attention span of man. I still buy stuff on Amazon. So somehow. Yeah. They get you to convert, right? <laughs> yes. Um, so segments, as it is GA3, you're migrating to GA4, the No. <laughs> and sadly, that's concept of segments, no. It's you need to create custom reports which are based on filtering. There is an area I didn't want to cover today because it, it's a quagmire of confusion. It's their explorer reports where you can actually create segment reports in there where you build a filter that's how you used to define the segments. I love segments. That's my, that's my thing that I miss the most. Yeah, there, you're better off to have it open and start creating them, either creating an Explorer segment in there and defining them. Second question, this is um, on migration. I've heard mixed stories on whether you should migrate versus create a new property. So that you can look at both in parallel. What do you recommend? Okay. The answer is both are equal. The migration doesn't actually kill your old one. That's, if you click migration, it's Google's taking some of your settings, moving them over. I tried it. I did not like the results because I saw things weren't turned on that I wanted turned on. Because Google's trying to make it as close to what you had. I wanted better than what I had. So if you start from scratch, you go through the assistant, it does, and it can still be linked to that particular property. It's also said, then you still keep getting that stupid clock countdown. And even people I know who did the migrate, they still get that stupid clock countdown. 
because it's just Google like, until I delete that thing, I'm going to get that clock. And I'm wondering what they'll do that, that your data is going away December 31st, back it up, take copies. You know, it'll probably be the next clock. So, yeah. Oh, yes. So, <laughs> yes, you can. So there's a couple issues. One is because you're measuring things differently. That's why I wanted people to get in as early as possible. So hopefully you have a, a good sampling that you can e say, you know, 1.1 of this is equivalent of whatever it is. Be aware that you need to start backing up your universal analytics data one of the, because it goes away after December 31st. That happened to the old Google Analytics. Before it was Universal Analytics, they gave about a year at that time, not six months. So that, you know, there's different people have different techniques for it. Uh, one of the things, if there's a report you like, you go in there and I save it as, as a Google Sheet, the report, uh, or save it as a CSV file. And, and some people are taking PDFs, printing the PDFs, just so they have, you know, give me a year's trend line. Or whatever it is, create some tables. So it's a it's it's a bit of a mess because there's no easy like export my data. Anything? Okay. When it comes to the UTM parameters, outside of being mindful of the new ones that you need to know about, is there any drastic changes when it comes to formatting the parameter, formatting them? No difference. So ninety percent of them have no impact. So for example. Understanding paid social versus paid search, you can still use CPC. Google now has a list of what it deems a social site. So it's being intelligent on the media, like the source big. So you don't have to change that one. And same thing how it's coming up with paid social. But now they have uh, medium is paid. You don't have to have CPC. So they've added a few new ones. Uh, but if you're on a social media site that Google doesn't have in the list, they have a code that you can put in. And how do you know what sites there? You can dig around and they'll give you a list of what sites are currently they deem as a social site. So obviously, you know, Pinterest, the big ones are there. But if you find, you know, I don't, I haven't seen any ads on Spoutable yet. Uh, but if, that, if you were putting something on Spoutable, they, it's not there. So if you're putting a link to something, so yeah, you'd probably want to use their new social media, you know, source codes. So you got to go through that list for all that. Just, if you see something looks weird, what I've been doing with clients, we see what's coming in, and then we do the channel report. And we say, "Show me source medium," or and we or the the site. First of all, the host name, and we go, "Does this make sense?" And it's like, "No, let's look at the source medium." Okay, we need to change that one. Nothing. It's Google is still processing it, and that, that unassigned. I guess you're running into that some of those weird. Just, I'm saying I'm looking back historically. I'm seeing it drop. I'm making notes of some numbers. So Google is figuring it out. For some clients, we have like ten percent of the traffic that is unassigned. Yeah, on that from yesterday. Yeah. Check. Take a look. Last week, one day, it probably is less because okay. Google is still processing it. So I think my personal opinion, and you know, I have no fact, Google throws all the traffic first intent assigned and then it starts assigning it. And at some point, the cl cl clock ticks push. And I haven't finished it yet. And maybe there's some new stuff in there that I'm not quite sure of that's not blatantly obvious. You know, traffic from Google's always going to show up as pay is organic search, right? <laughs> like, you know, if it came from Bing, sure. Because but if you ever look at source medium unassigned, you'll see it's blank because it hasn't even finished processing it. So I've done it, and I've seen it gone from like over 20%, drop down to like five. And I haven't gone back months later to see what it drops further. So I'm guessing it's just a processing issue. And I'm hoping they get more power to process it faster. Anything else? Oh, right in there, middle. Okay, 
Great question. So in Universal Analytics, it didn't actually ever use Google Signals. It used it in the user report data. Like yeah. you have this main, it was not Google Signals. It wasn't using it to track users. It was using just to populate those demographic reports. Mm -hmm. If you don't enable it, so in the technical setting, I showed you like, yeah, you have to come in here. You have to get, you have to say, yeah, I give permission to use it. That's why they say you need to add a line. If you read the fine print, you should be putting something in your privacy policy. Right beyond your cookies, but I can't find proper wording. So if I had great wording, I'd have it up here for everybody. If it's not enabled, you're going to get still that thresholding issue. It, Google doesn't care that it's not enabled. It's just not working. So if you're not enabling it, go back to device-based tracking. Device-based tracking doesn't care about Google signals, but then you'll get probably lower numbers that are much closer to what you had in Universal Analytics, because and sometimes. You know, clients, I explain this to them, they say, just turn it on. Other ones go, oh, we're going to go talk to our lawyers. And the lawyer goes, what is he talking about? <laughs> if, Google, if they gave permission to Google already, I don't care, right? It's like, I can't get a straight answer from anybody. So maybe that's my next article or something. <laughs> but yes, so yes, you have to go in there. You, you can turn it off for certain, you can turn off Google signals for certain countries, for example. It can get very granular. There's a list of, I think, 306 countries. And they're all automatically selected. You just have to say, yeah, run it in all countries. Why are you giving me that choice, Google? You should know what countries it would be illegal to run this in. Thank you. <laughs> like, I don't have that knowledge. So yes, but yes, you have to enable it. Or else, but like I said, that by default, it's this blended one. But their modeling isn't enabled yet. And Google Signals, you have to accept. So why is that my default? And then it really messes up your, uh, you know, your, your throttling or the thresholding. But that was a great question. Anything else? Like one more. One more? Any? <laughs> going, going. <laughs> what, about, what about the I.O. conference with the AI integration with the Google search? Do you have any comments about that? None, because it's not what it will do. We'll, we will use Google Analytics to see. <laughs> right? That's, that's where we'll see impacts. And that's what analytics were always for. Analytics were never the source of record. You know, you didn't run an e-commerce site. Let's say I had issues with Shopify. Shopify is telling me my sales were this. Google Analytics is telling me they're 10% less. Okay, well, how many users didn't accept cookies? How many users, uh, there was a little blip on the internet. I did an article and I came down and it was like, sometimes they were within 2% and sometimes they were 10% because just blips happen. It's not a tr record of truth. If you want record of truth, you go to the source. You go to the accounting department, right? And that analytics was never meant to be that. It was meant to monitor, you know, overall usage, you know, overall performance, what's working, what's not working. And going back to when uh, Peter was asking the question, it's numbers are numbers. Telling you you have 50 conversions and versus 51, is that one really that make or break? Shouldn't be. But when you were getting zero, that's a big improvement, right? You went from 25 to 50, well, wow, you know, 100% improvement. That's what you want to talk about, and that's what KPI should always be as those percentages or ratios. All right. Thank you, everybody.